Have you thought this through? No way will that work. Are you sure? Is there any money in that? You'll okay. never make any money doing that. How are you going to get the mortgage? Just get a job. Are you going to try to tell that? Why can't you be normal like anybody else? All right. Were your parents morons too? The savvy entrepreneur to the rescue. Congratulations. That really turned out well. I'm really good job. I'm getting ready. I'm surprised. You know, I wish I thought of that. I never thought of anyone then. How did you do that? I'm so glad you're here. I wish I had the courage to follow my dreams. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. We're broadcasting on WLCB 101.5 FM from the greater Chicago, Milwaukee area. If you are or want to be an entrepreneur or small business person, this show is for you. I'm Doris Nagel, your host for the next hour. I'm a serial entrepreneur myself, and I've also counseled lots of startups and small businesses over the past 30 years. The show has two goals, to share helpful information and resources and to inspire you, hopefully making your journey as an entrepreneur faster and easier and maybe just a little bit more fun. Now, to help with that, I have guests every week on the show who are willing to share their stories and their advice. And this week we have not one, but two guests. Our guests are Stefan Augustin and MJ Anderson, and they are the co-founders of a Wisconsin startup called Reality Blue. Reality Blue is the leading augmented reality platform for marketers. And I'll be very honest with you because I'm not a marketer and I'm not all that tech savvy. I'm not sure what that is, but I know we're going to find out lots as we chat with Stefan and MJ. Now, Stefan and MJ both each have 30 plus years combined experience. Stefan's background is in media and technology startups and augmented reality. 3D visualization, advertising and marketing, among other things. He currently operates as Reality Blue's chief executive officer. And an interesting fact about him is that his family hails from Iceland. And he is a 3X startup, meaning this is his third go around in terms of uh, in terms of establishing startups and um, successfully exiting. Now, MJ's background is in creative and strategic development, multi-channel marketing, and relationship management. He is a 2X startup and a creative industry leader, and he currently acts as the chief experience officer of the company and is originally from Chicago. Now, an interesting fact is that the two of them have known each other for 23 years, and they finally decided to partner up and form Reality Blue. Now, with that introduction, I'd like to welcome the two of you, Stefan and MJ. Welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. Thanks for being here today. Well, thanks for having us. We're really looking forward to this conversation and sharing Go our. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, just you know, looking forward to sharing our experiences and how we got started with the business and helping people understand what augmented reality is all about. Absolutely. Well, I think the place to start is to talk a little bit about your business. I mean, exactly what does Reality Blue do and what niche does it serve with your customers? Sure. Uh, thanks, Doris. So Reality Blue is essentially a, a SaaS platform. So software as a service platform. So that means um, our, our software is delivered via the internet uh, through a subscription. Um, and it's designed for creative people and marketing people who are typically not going to be uh, very technical savvy or, or that won't be their primary you know, focus in life. So we wanted to build a tool set that would allow uh, creative individuals and individuals whose main role is marketing to, to be able to really easily create, deploy, manage, and measure augmented reality content um, in relationship to all the other things that they might be doing uh, in conjunction with a marketing effort. Really interesting. So what are some ways that marketing people use augmented reality or use your your software? 
Yeah, great, great question. So um, over the last five or six years, there's been an enormous uh, shift in the way that we as human beings deal with, with media. In 2013, um, we saw a uh, the, the teeter-totter kind of tip. So when I say teeter-totter, I mean we, we as a society transitioned from a computer-based you know, interaction with media or even a television-based uh, interaction with media to more of a, um, a handset or a, a mobile uh, interaction with content. Um, and it's you know pretty obvious today. If, you know, if I took your smartphone away from you for 20 minutes, you might begin to to get nervous and shake. And that's because <laughs> we we we, we you, all you, are, you already have pegged me right. Yeah, yeah, you're like most. If you're like most people, that's the truth. In fact, most most Americans today will will look at their phone screen uh, on average about 170 times a day. Okay, in a in a in well, a that's eight insane. Hour. Yeah, That's it's, embarrassing, it's, actually. Yeah, so so that fact alone has created a demand for content, both entertainment and marketing content, uh, that's that's designed to be delivered through that small screen. Um, and augmented reality is a really great tool since it requires you know a, a connection to the internet and a screen and your your phone essentially to to view it. Um, it's created a a great way for marketers to deliver information uh, to an audience base that's already predestined to to receive it because they're so engaged with the phone. Well, so what well, might be an that I that I get might be in marketing messages, but would I I don't even would I even know if it's been augmented or Oh, I mean, what yeah. what might you do with with your marketing to be able to use it and augment it? Yeah, sure. So a really uh, easy example, I think a lot of people know what Pokemon Go was. Uh, that's a form of augmented reality. But a really a more useful use of the technology is something like um, was first shown probably to the masses uh, through an application from Ikea. Uh, which allowed you to actually uh, place a piece of virtual furniture in your living room and see what a couch or a table or a chair or a lamp. Uh, 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 so, and they you are know, more recently, you know, there's a, a number of different companies that are uh, showing those kinds of technologies and showing those kinds of things inside their, their tools or their, their application for consumers. So what our technology does is the, it's the stuff that sits behind all that that allows people to easily uh, create these 3D models and be able to place them inside their environment. And we do it uh, both for uh, a mobile app as well as if it's you're viewing uh, the experience through a web browser. So there's kind of two different ways to be able to have the consumer engage with augmented reality. One of them is if you're in a mobile app and the other one is if you're on a website. And so it's something as simple as clicking a button, say, uh, see in room, and then it might show you the couch or the table, the lamp. Then you can just you know, place it or move it around inside your space and see what that object looks like inside of your uh, your room. So that's a really simple example, but uh, we have a number of different ways those that same technology is used for manufacturers may want to see what equipment looks like or their uh, engineers are building a new piece of equipment and they can take something right out of their uh, CAD system where they're designing things and be able to see what it looks like or show other people what it might look like in a specific space. Uh, you know, so. From a consumer side, uh, it's great to be able to see furniture and uh, product, and especially you know over this last year with COVID, it's really seen a huge explosion because people haven't been going to the stores. You're ordering more and more things off of Amazon or other e-commerce sites. Uh, so what this technology allows you to do is actually see what that blender or coffee maker or um, you know television set or computer or whatever the thing is that you're buying might look like with uh, you not being able to go to the store to actually touch it and see it. Uh, before you actually buy it. So, uh, you know, the augmented object has really replaced the need to actually go into a retail space in person and allows you to actually have wow. connection with that at home, but before you actually buy it. So, you know, if anything good has come out of COVID, the, for us, <laughs> the biggest things have been uh, the bigger use and uh, acceptance of QR codes and the you know, online shopping experience with these you know, kind of virtual or, you know, uh, augmented reality experiences. Uh, for virtual product placement. 
a, a lot of it has to do with um, giving a, a marketer the ability to deliver very, very media rich um, content through the phone. And when I say media rich, I mean, you know, Stefan mentioned 3D, but we can also, you know, uh, display video and audio and we can do all those things in in context to the environment that the that the consumer is in so instead of um, it, it's like really it's like delivering 3d media rich web content through the phone that uh, that relies on either the environment that they're standing in or it might rely on you know something that they're holding in their hand that was delivered by the marketer very cool well I actually used some kind of augmented reality and I didn't even know that's what it was. I recently moved and I wanted to buy a TV for my wall and it helped me figure out what size TV was right for my wall size. In fact, the size I thought wasn't good for the proportions for the wall. So that, yeah. that led me to buy a different size TV, which I think yeah. that's exactly well, what you're talking about, right? Here's one, I'll, I'll tell you this. So augmented reality has actually been around for, for quite some time. It's just now kind of coming to the forefront of mass adoption and public acceptance. But if you've ever watched an NFL football game, right, every time you see that yellow stripe go across the field that tells you as a viewer where the first down marker is, that's a form of augmented reality. And uh -huh. that's that's been in place since 1977. So it's a technology that's that's been around. It's just it's now coming into its its full uh, maturity because of our mobile lifestyle. Very very interesting. So who are most of your customers? Are they big company marketers? Are they small company marketers? Or a complete mix of the two? Yeah, so that's a great question. We have actually a, a, a really wide range everything from you know fortune 100 companies down to individual marketers that are using the platform uh, and they have a lot of different kind of use cases so you know the thing we talked about before was very simple uh, we have some people doing some very complex work with uh, being able to tie it into a lot of their different omni-channel uh, needs so trying to tie in augmented reality to all their other marketing uh, tool sets they may augment, uh, be able to point the camera at a manual or a catalog and be able to have those pages come to life, kind of like you would have seen uh, Hollywood during Potter movies, right? Where the yeah. Music, uh, we do things like that with the technology. We have the, the 3D models we place. Uh, we're doing quite a bit lately with uh, colleges, universities, and professional sports organizations with fan engagement, which just, you know, basically taking that, instead of it being a couch, we can take your mascot uh, make it come to life so it can help you celebrate at home instead of uh, maybe while you were used to go to the games, you're celebrating at home with friends or at the bar now. Uh, we can bring those mascots to, to the end users instead of having them uh, potentially being at those locations. Uh, we're seeing a huge potential in that area right now. Uh, but yeah, our, our customers are everything from really large organizations very down to very, very small uh, groups of people. Uh, and our platform was built for that kind of um, wide range as well. So it's really a useful technology across the board. Uh, we haven't really seen an industry that can't be impacted uh, by the use of uh, augmented reality. Uh, obviously, we have some very uh, significant focuses on uh, fan engagement, as well as uh, people wanting to bring some of these manuals and other things to life, the printed materials. So how is virtual reality different from augmented reality? or is that's that a board line or? No, no, that's that's really good. So I'll give you a little bit of a technical thing. There's a there's a thing called the Milgram's uh, continuum, and it's um, it's basically a definition of um, of that defines augmented reality in context to our real life experience, and then ultimately virtual reality. So if you look at if you think of a, a linear line that goes from left to right. Um, everything on the left side uh, of that line, the, the, at the beginning point of that line, would be our uh, interaction with the real world, and, which is known as reality. Um, the other end of the spectrum is uh, something called virtual reality, and everything between that would be considered either mixed reality or augmented reality. And, and they're really the, the purpose of this continuum is to kind of help us understand that on the other side of the coin from reality is something called virtual reality, which is 
uh, the premise of virtual reality is to completely convince your mind that your body uh, and your person is not in the location that it actually is. So typically, virtual reality is going to be defined by any any um, electronic experience where you're typically going to be wearing a completely immersive headset that makes your mind think that it's in a completely different place. I would say it makes, it, you know, virtual reality is all about convincing your butt that you're not sitting in the chair that you're sitting in, right? <laughs> Uh, where and and so it's a fully immersive experience I meaning you wear a headset that kind of blocks out the the world around you and you see this projection of a, an alternative universe or an alternative uh, reality in in augmented reality um, it's different because we're viewing these experiences through a handset so your eyes can still see the world around you and you're viewing content that's been augmented through the, the, the screen on your phone. Does that make sense? So you yeah. have, you are fully aware that, hey, my butt is in Beloit, and I am looking at something here in Beloit, and I am, but that something that I'm looking at is, is augmented with digital content that I'm seeing through the phone. Yeah, yeah. Whereas my children, my children might be playing uh, a video game where they have a headset on and their butt might be in, you know, at home, but they think they're on another planet because they've got a completely immersive uh, set of Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And I can see how things with things like movies and um, games, video games that there's probably some elements of both virtual reality and yeah. augmented reality, right? Yeah, and that's called mixed reality. Very cool. Well, our, let's back up and talk about how the two of you got started. So you mentioned that you've known each other for 23 years. What made you, the two of you finally come together to form this company? So um, I met Stefan sometime uh, right after I started my last company um, in like the mid early the or mid early 90s, um, and we met because um, at that point in time we were both uh, very very interested in this brand new shiny thing called the World Wide Web. Um, if you if you can go back to that point in history in like 1993 1994 there was no. <laughs> There was no World Wide it's Web. Hard, it's hard to believe. Right, right, exactly. It's it's hard to believe it. Yeah, so, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Hard to even ask what that was. Yeah, yeah. So so we both started businesses at that point in time, and we were both located at that point in Rockford. Um, and we'd had some. We you know we, we kind of you know traveled in the same kind of circles and, and met there, um, and then. Eventually, Stefan had created his first company, which was a, a digital printing company, and my company at that time, which is a, an agency, um, a digital agency, uh, did a lot of work with him. So we, we, you know, we we shared customers and, and went to market together and, and shared a, a, a solution. Um, after Stefan left that or sold that business, he created another company and. Uh, I'd still been working at the company that I was that I had founded, but um, I was started to work in the in the late uh, well, actually like 2009 2010 with this technology called augmented reality, and um, his business at that time um, there was I, at least I thought there was a, an opportunity for him to kind of utilize AR as part of his solution set, uh, but at the time the technology just wasn't there. Right. It didn't fit his business model and so forth. So as it turns out, he sold that business. And right around that time, he started to listen to some of the, you know, the ideas that we had been talking about. And we decided, you know what, this, this is a viable opportunity here. So I sold the shares in my previous company to my business partner and we started Reality Blue together. And that was in, I think we, we opened our doors in April of 2017. Well, how did you come up with the name for this company? I get the reality part, but where does the blue come from? So blue comes from uh, Wild Blue Yonder, right? So if you think about, uh, we wanted to kind of paint a picture of, you know, endless opportunity. Uh, and and obviously, because it's, a you know, an AR thing, we wanted to use the term reality because it seemed like, 
you know, the logical thing to do. So instead of saying reality wild blue yonder, we just kind of <laughs> punch it into reality blue. I love it. So how did you get started with this? I mean, did you do your own coding or did you find people to, yeah, to so, develop the software? And how did you, you know, how well, did you get started yeah. to launch the company? Yeah, so between the two of us, we've probably built, you know, literally hundreds of different uh, kind of solutions for customers, uh, both ourselves as well, for ourselves as well as for our customers, uh, both writing our, ourselves as well as uh, working with uh, coders on our team. Uh, this time around, we took kind of a step back, looked at the industry as a whole, uh, tried to find other tools that were out there that might be able to help us uh, achieve our vision for making this a really easy to use platform for marketers to be able to create augmented reality without having to know any code. Uh, so if you want to think of this as kind of like Canva, right? You don't have to know how to use any of the design tools. You can uh, literally get started uh, today and make something that's seemingly very complex uh, to the end consumer, but you can do it without having to know how to do any of the technology in the background. Uh, we went out and found a group of developers that's actually overseas uh, that we partnered with. They're actually in um, uh, Minsk, which is in a country called Belarus. Uh, yeah. We've been partnering with them very, very early on. Uh, we also have a team here now as well, after we went through a round of funding last fall. Uh, so we're building uh, an onshore team as well as uh, maintaining our offshore team. Uh, we got about 10 people that are uh, part of the whole organization, uh, do everything from mobile app development through uh, creating what the thing looks like and then also an R&D effort in the background. Uh, both MJ and I have uh, technical backgrounds, uh, you know, led technical teams before. So we kind of, we determine the course of the, where we're going to go, which technologies we're going to use, and how we're going to string some of these open source tools together. Uh, and then we rely on a group of people. This is a project that couldn't be done by you know, two guys uh, at the time at, at a kitchen table when we first started, right? We've obviously graduated to having a real office now, but um, at the time, you know, we were were trying to build something. We took um, uh, about a year, year and a half. Of building the product and kind of under cover of darkness. Uh, we did a couple of small projects for customer, customers that first year, but um, we brought a product to market in about a year, year and a half that would typically take a team probably two or three years to build. And it's just because we've had such a, you know, vast experiences over the, you know, other careers that we've had. Uh, that we knew how to build these things. We knew the building blocks. We knew all the things we needed. Uh, to have in place to be able to have a, a successful product launch. Um, so we actually built it relatively inexpensively uh, with a, a small group of people uh, in a very short period of time before we actually had a, a viable product out in the marketplace. So, you know, I, I think a lot of that owes to just our experience and, you know, being, you know, not our, it's not the first time we built one of these things and it's not our first business. So yeah. a lot of the back experience really helped be able to get our business off the ground much, much faster. Interesting. So uh, that explains how you came up with the initial product offering. How did you know there was a market for it? I mean, there's, the world is full of cool ideas that nobody actually wants to pay for. How did you know there was a market for this? So between Stefan and I, we've got probably over close to 60 years of experience in our in our industry. And in both of our careers, We've always had a, a solid grasp of the pulse of what was happening in our industry or in our industry and in our in the industries that are kind of ancillary to, to ours. So from our standpoint, you know, we have both seen, you know, multiple technology waves come and go over our careers. So when I mentioned earlier this whole Internet web thing, we were right there at the very, very dawn of the web. And this one. Um, me and this is me personally saying that this one felt a lot like it did uh, in the early 90s and after doing it i believe that this one will actually have a larger effect on us as human beings than even the web did because it it ultimately will change the way that we interact with the world as well as the way that we perceive and interact with with content so we're still at the very early, early stages of adoption it, you know, at the consumer level, 
And as we build tools and as the, the marketplace matures, it's going to change the way that we perceive nature as well as the way that we, we perceive and, and consume content. And I think that's, that's really, I, I can't say enough about how when you add the third axis, I mean, you know, actually you've got an X, Y axis that describes, you know, a flat surface. When you add that third Z axis, the ramifications of doing that for a communicator, it's, it's massive. So that's, oh, okay. that's how we're I, I got to ask you to elaborate on that because that's a pretty bold claim. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't doubt that you're right, but help me and the listeners connect okay. some of the dots of why you think that. Yeah, great, great question. So if I hand you a book, right, you intuitively know what to do with it. You know that you open up the first leaf, you start reading from left to right. The book is a delivery method for information that we're all, it's ingrained in our, in our humanity. It's, you know, it's been part of the way that we've communicated for forever since we were, you know, since we were putting, you know, cuneiform imprints in clay tablets. It's the way that we communicate, it's the way that we communicated and it's the way that we stored information. So when I talk about an X, Y axis, I'm essentially talking about in modern terms, uh, a page. Right, so you have a you have a a start and an end point on a page. You have a certain amount of content that you can put on that page, and for the most part, it's a 2D interaction with you. You hold it in your hand, you look at it, you consume it. Right. All right. So the same is actually true for the way a computer monitor works. Right. A web page is essentially just a 2D electronic version of a page. All right. So. Outside of that, we live in a 3D space. We live in, and we, we move our in, in life through a 3D environment. And we interact with things very organically. We touch, we smell, we see, we hear, and we do all those things. So the, the, the thing that's different and that's changing is we will ultimately be moving away from a reliance on a 2D method for creation and delivery of information and we will be able to rely on a three-dimensional organizational construct and, and viewing construct. And so we all carry these things around in our pockets called smartphones, okay? So this technology is, is probably got another five years before it's, it's obsolete. And it's, and it might, it might even be sooner. Oh, wow. No wonder yeah. Apple keeps pushing new versions of their phone and Samsung too, yeah. right? Well, yes. And so if you look at what, what Apple's doing, what Samsung's doing, what Microsoft's doing, all the large players in, in the space are doing, they've invested billions and billions of dollars in new technologies that will eventually replace the handset. And the, those technologies in the short term will be wearables, things that you wear on your face, like a pair of glasses. Apple's already released you know, plans to release a set of products in 2022, 2023, that their intended purpose is to sunset the, the smartphone. And you'll wear, you'll wear these glasses on your face and you'll be able to see the world in an augmented view just by looking through the, the lens, okay? And then ultimately, the next step from that will be, okay, glasses will, will be here for a, a very short period of time. And then we'll have a very, very tight integration between us and technology, so either contact lenses or implants of some sort that actually will give us the ability to see things in a completely different manner. So that's the that's just the hardware fact. That's the technology. That's where the the hardware is going. But if you think about what it takes as human beings to kind of catch up with that technology, we have to figure out and grapple with how do we communicate in a 3D space? How do we change the way that we present information? And that's really kind of one of our core uh, missions is to help people easily make that transition. Well, you can't see me right now, but my jaw is positively on the floor right now. And guys, I really hate to do this because what you've said is just prompting lots more questions. But we need to take a quick break right now for station identification. So stay tuned, folks. We will be right back. This is Doris Nagel, and you're listening to the Savvy Entrepreneur Show. My guests this week are the co-founders of a Wisconsin-based company called Reality Blue, which helps marketers with augmented reality. 
Before the break, they were talking about the future of augmented reality and how soon it will completely change how we interact with one another and in ways that I think most of us probably are not really prepared for and can't even imagine. But, you know, a, a question about that. So social media lately has taken a lot of flack, Twitter, Facebook, and others, for the way that they can be used to manipulate people, heavily influence public opinion, and frankly be abused to create misperceptions and even incite violence. And I'm envisioning immersive experiences as being even more susceptible maybe vastly more susceptible to manipulating people. It seems to me there there probably are some pretty significant ethical issues to think about here. Yeah, it, it's if you take a historical perspective and look at this, I had a, in my previous business, I had a, a, a business partner that had a great set of slides. And it was essentially, they were comments from the time, either from from publications or from, you know, from books that made mention of every time that we've gone through this exact same kind of thing. And it starts with like, you know, moving from movable type to, you know, to a better way to, to produce a book to writing coursework on a slate, uh, you know, like on a, on a chalkboard to then moving to paper from paper to pen and ink from pen and ink to, to a ballpoint pen and pencil and so forth. And every right. time we one of these transitions, it's been disruptive, right? right. Uh, this, this one, though, is going to be completely disruptive because it, it is going to open up so many, many more opportunities. My grandchildren, so I've got a granddaughter. She, you know, she's going to live in a world where she won't know what, she might not even know what an email address is. Or you know what I mean? She she'll it'll be it'll be a completely immersive content experience. Well, I'm just thinking here that too of COVID may have kind of accelerated some of the acceptance of this, but I'm envisioning as you're talking that you don't need to have actual face to face meetings a lot of times. You're in a conference room and as far as you know, the other participants are in the same room as you, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, so there's some things that are happening with the way to capture, you know, you as a person or as your, your your likeness and be able to transport your likeness to a different location to be able to interact with other people through these virtual meetings. You know, everybody's used to being on Zoom calls now or whatever the other you know, technologies you might use are to be able to have these video conferences. But if you think about like what MJ was talking about earlier with the wearable devices and where we're going with that, It'll allow us to not have our heads down uh, looking at a device. So if you think about how often are you sitting there with your head, you know, your neck down looking at your phone or your tablet versus if you could actually just have your head up and be able to look through, you know, look at the world and be able to actually have some of those same interactions with other things through a pair of glasses or contacts or whatever is uh, coming after that. You know, it, it allows us to be able to transport not only other likenesses, but all their information you may be wanting to interact with. Um, you know, so obviously there are ways to think about this as negative impacts, like we've seen with some of the social media um, interactions lately. But I think that's really just a matter of more about how industry and people are manipulating and using uh, data and information. And I think a lot of those problems will, you know, rectify themselves. But a lot of those things also have opportunities to be able to expand your uh, information access and be able to have interactions with physical objects and be able to, you know, learn more about the world that's around you without having to look it up on your phone and have your head down looking at this tiny little screen that's in front of you with your head actually up and be able to actually see overlays of information about things at a museum or when you go to visit a certain location or even, you know, have simple things like driving directions with other information that's about things that are around you. So I yeah, think, you know, you know I'm, I'm even thinking of, I did a test drive of a BMW when I was looking for a car a couple years ago. I didn't mm -hmm. actually buy it, but I thought it was fun to take a test drive. And they had this, you know, where you could like wave your hand in front of you and see different things. And it was yeah. kind of an overlay. On, and I think that's the kind of thing you're referring to, right? That's correct. Yeah. There's actually a company from Germany who's 
BM, uh, working with BMW, Volkswagen, uh, Porsche, and uh, others to actually make that whole your whole uh, windshield become a, a screen. So it's basically going to have an, a digital overlay for you to be able to have a heads-up display. So what you as a driver sees from your perspective may be different than what the passengers see. So you may be able to see how fast you're going, where the driving directions or the information that you need to have without having to look down, whereas others may have entertainment type of information that they can actually see. So you know, there's a lot of interesting ways to use this thing that we call augmented reality. There's literally thousands of different ways to utilize the, the information and the things that are available to us. You know, we're focusing on how can marketers help be able to enhance people's uh, lives, product experiences, and be able to you know, have higher conversions in these kinds of things that marketers think about. But you know, every time we you know, have this initial conversation or show somebody these technologies, you can um, usually see their, their mind start racing about all the different ways you can actually use this stuff. And we usually have to rein them back into it, like, okay, this is what the technology <laughs> we're doing today, and this is what you know the, the vision of what this is going to be in the future. And it's you know the, the opportunities are literally limitless right now. It's jaw dropping. Uh, all right, well, so that's kind of the theoretical underpinnings of what you're doing and where yeah. the business is going. To turn back to kind of the nuts and bolts of your company today you mentioned funding that you've gotten a new round of funding did you start out looking for funding or was this a, a bootstrapped operation initially yeah, so, um the uh, we actually bootstrapped the business for the first uh, two years uh, and then as we saw the need to really expand the business quicker and have access to more capital to be able to bring on more people as well as to you know accelerate our development and also go to market strategy, we actually went through an accelerator program uh, out of Milwaukee from a company called Generator, one of six companies uh, selected out of 1,500 that applied for the funding. Uh, it was a great program, helped us learn how to talk to investors, which is something neither of us had had to do in our previous businesses, is go out and raise money, which is a whole other subject matter in and of itself. Uh, but it was a great program, this accelerator program, to really learn how to present, you know, create a presentation, all the materials that you needed to have, as well as to have access to, they made, you know, over, I think in June and July, we, or me personally, talked to uh, probably about 180 different investors through Zoom. Uh, unfortunately, this year we didn't have the opportunity to talk to a lot of these guys in person. And then we just, we kind of kept on with those conversations uh, and got through a round of funding with a, a smaller group of those people who decided to invest in our business. But just the process of actually raising money was... Uh, it, it took a solid year to do that. Yeah. I mean, a, wow. a, a, it took a solid year of almost, between the two of us, probably you know 80% of our time, realistically. So we were very fortunate to be able to uh, go out and raise the money we did raise through COVID. Uh, I know a lot of businesses uh, weren't able to get the funding that they were looking for, uh, as well as obviously a lot of businesses you know, folded during that time frame. So uh, we consider ourselves very fortunate. I think a lot of that has to do with COVID opened up a lot of opportunities for the technology to you know, come to the forefront, uh, as well as it's obviously, it's, it's an area of interest for some of the larger companies like Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple, and others that are literally, like MJ was saying earlier, are investing billions of dollars every year in uh, augmented reality and a technology infrastructure uh, in the background. So all the, you know, the cameras, uh, the, the phones, uh, the, the baseline software that they're using for both Android and iOS that we're building our business on top of in our technology stack. So we've been, you know, it's like they're building a whole other version of, if you want to think about it, there's another version of the World Wide Web that's becoming uh, available to us as a 3D environment that we're basically building our business on top of taking advantage of all that infrastructure that these huge you know, businesses are building for us. My jaw is still on the floor just <laughs> thinking about some of this. So talk about some of the roadblocks that you've dealt with. Obviously, finding funding was challenging, but every company has to go through usually some tough times and things that yeah. maybe were unexpected. Talk a little bit about some of those you know for the, first, the first couple of years you know obviously the funding was a, a huge uh, you know thing to overcome for us just to get us past uh, having to be you know self-funded and try to you know find enough business to keep on the, the business keep on going so you know the funding really helped us accelerate uh, our 
our business as well, you know, bringing out new people as well as uh, developers and salespeople and you know, our marketing efforts, those kinds of things. But you know, before that, uh, really the biggest stumbling block we had was getting people to understand that this technology was easily accessible, it was affordable, and also you know, just how do they get it delivered. Uh, the first couple of years, we delivered everything we did for the company was through mobile apps. Uh, and more recently, we've been able to you know, take that same technology and everything we've built before and port it over to be able to have everything happen through a web browser. And that's been a huge boon for us. Uh, you know, kind of a, a, that was a big stumbling block for a lot of people is they just didn't want to have to figure out how to build a mobile app. There was a you know a fairly decent size investment that was required to be able to build a mobile app. And you know, we've seen a huge uh, turn with people who you know before said it wasn't in their budget or they weren't really you know, understanding how they were going to implement it in their business. To now, it's literally phone calls that you know people we've talked to from the last two years are calling us. Saying how do we get involved? You know, this seems like a lot easier to get involved with. Uh, we've really tried to simplify the offering that we brought to market too. I think that's been one of the biggest stumbling blocks before. I was talking about it's literally there's thousands of different ways to use this technology. Uh, we try to focus on just a you know a handful that makes sense for marketers and solve some very specific problems for them, uh, which makes it a lot easier to have people take advantage of the technology in a state right now. Well, I, I can imagine, given what you've already said, that deciding where to stay focused out of all the incredible number of things that could be done has got to be challenging. What are some of the new things you're working on? To the extent you can talk about them, obviously, <laughs> you're in a pretty competitive environment, so I don't want you to... You no, know, no, no, sharing no. state secrets, but just kind of where you see the company heading. Yeah, so we just in December rolled out our Web AR offering. So that's I think Stefan mentioned that previous. So Web AR is essentially a way for uh, people to interact with AR content without having to download a mobile app. So they just use the web browser that they have on their phone to do that, and that's huge because we were finding that. Because AR, where it's at in the world today, people have there's this perception that people don't 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 want to download mobile apps to do things. So from a marketing standpoint, we were able to eliminate that stumbling block. So that was big. This technology then is is essentially going to be um, a, a platform that we stand on to deliver other kinds of AR content experiences or or what we call scenes. One of which is a new thing that we're going to be releasing hopefully here in the next month and a half or so, and that's something called AR portals. So an AR portal is the ability to place, it's a, it's, it's a way to deliver that mixed reality experience we were just talking about. So imagine being able to place a doorway on the ground in front of you, and when you, with your phone, walk through that doorway, that you can see on your phone, it completely transports you to a, a new environment. And that new environment, you can look with your phone and see it in 360 degree full motion and action. So that's something that we're very, very excited about that's coming up. There are some other things that we're working on right now that are also very cool and that's really simple delivery of games through AR. And that's, that's a very, very new endeavor for us. We started playing with that just this week and have got some pretty cool uh, results from that. So that's like the very, very short term kind of stuff. You know, ultimately our, our technology roadmap does extend out beyond those things, but to Stefan's point, we have to kind of pick, you know, and choose our, our focuses because, you know, from our standpoint, one of our roadblocks I think was for the first three years of this business, it was just him and I and our development team that was overseas. So not having access to more brain power, more manpower, more person power, really, I, can't, I think was, you know, was a challenge for us. Yeah. So where would you like the company to be in, say, three to five years? I, I guess I should narrow that because the difference between three and five for a company like yours is probably <laughs> an order of magnitude. So, you know, so let's just take three years. Where do you want to be in three years? In three years, we will have gone through another funding round. That's probably going to start in as little as uh, eight to 12 months from where we're at today, um, which means uh, we will have experienced 
some serious growth. The five-year plan is ultimately to, to either be acquired or to uh, acquire and do whatever it is we can to you know, blow the doors off of this one. To add value to our customers, but then also to, to be there to add significant value to our investment partners. Stefan, anything to add to that? No, he hit it right on the nail on the head. I mean, our goal right now is, uh, you know, continue to grow the business both from a technology standpoint as well as revenue. So we have some fairly high goals on both fronts for this year. Uh, we've hit most of those targets so far as we go through Q1. Uh, you know, we're looking for bringing on some more people this year. So I, I think, you know, we're going to be growing the business as much in Wisconsin as we possibly can. I think people underestimate this uh, ability to grow a technology business, not only just in Wisconsin, but in the Midwest. But we're seeing significant numbers of people that are leaving both East Coast and West Coast. I think seeing the value that you can get for you know, what it takes to actually run a business. Early on, we had a lot of people say, you know, if you're not in San Francisco or Los Angeles or Portland or Seattle, you know, this technology business that you've chosen to be in isn't really a viable thing. You have to be out in all those places. When you start looking at what it costs to run a business out there, we would have had to raise four times the amount of money we did to be able to accomplish what we've done here. Uh, it just doesn't make any sense. So, you know, for us, we want to grow the business as much as possible here in Wisconsin and in the Midwest as much as we, as much as we can. Yeah, well, that's another area where COVID may have had some positive impact for places like the Midwest and even communities that are outside of major metropolitan areas, right, like Chicago or Milwaukee, where mm -hmm. uh, quality of life is just really good if you have, you know, wonderful jobs with companies like yours. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we, I mean we're, our business is based in Beloit, and we've been uh, really impressed with the, you know, access to te uh, technology and technologists here. There's a number of other pretty large technology-based businesses that are in the area that have shown us that it's possible to build, you know, uh, multi-organizations of, you know, a few hundred people, um, you know, half or more of which are engineers here in the area. Obviously, with COVID in the last year, you know, a lot of those engineers are not working from home, <laughs> but at some point we expect to see them back here in the office area and the office park that we're in. You know, so it's 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 been a challenge uh, sometimes to find the right talent, but honestly, with COVID, it's actually, like you said, it's opened up a lot of doors. And a lot of people are willing to work remotely right now and, you know, possibly looking at re relocation from being in these major metropolitan areas. So that's part of what we're going to continue to grow the business on is, you know, find the right people, hopefully here in the area, but if they're not, we'll obviously work with them remotely as you know, we've seen that that's possible. Now. I'm just amazed, you know, uh, I think the challenge for serial entrepreneurs like both of you is figuring out what to do next. And so I, I guess the question is, do you think you'll get tired of working on this business or more likely you'll probably just get an offer you can't refuse and then what's yeah. your what's your next act yeah i think we're both kind of serial entrepreneurs so i don't know that you ever get tired of to me for me personally you, you know these businesses are like my children you know what i mean so you don't get tired of your children i, I don't ever see myself <laughs> getting tired of, of the company or the work i might not you know i might get interested and do something want to do something else at some point but you know, from our standpoint, at least from my standpoint, you know, I, my personal goals with this business, you know, are to ultimately generate generational wealth, you know, for my family. And that's okay. one of my motivators. What about you, Stefan? Yeah, no, I mean, the reason I got interested in this space in particular, obviously, MJ has been harping on it and me for the better part of a decade now, but when you start looking at the technology investments of companies like Apple and Facebook and Google and Samsung are you know, literally just pouring billions of dollars into this specific area, you can see this is their, they believe that uh, augmented reality and virtual reality are the future of how they're gonna you know, drive their technology businesses. And so there's obviously gonna be opportunities for companies like ours to be able to piggyback on top of that infrastructure they're building and be able to build tools for other people on that. If you look at you know, what's been done in the past with companies like, if you think about a company even as big as a, a Salesforce, right? The Salesforce wouldn't exist without the internet, it wouldn't exist without some of the tools that Microsoft and Apple 
and Google for that matter brought to you know uh, their ability to use. And so we're hoping to build a business uh, you know on this infrastructure. I saw the opportunity that you know is uh, I think is a very very large uh, opportunity for us to build a great uh, very large business and or become part of a, a larger business either through acquisitions uh, that we either make or become part of. So looking back on both of your journeys as entrepreneurs, what advice would you give your younger self or to <laughs> other people who maybe are just thinking about starting on their journey as an entrepreneur? Hands down, hands down is if I could go back to my 25 year old self, I would say understand and learn that there's this alternate business universe out there uh, that's all about investment capital, okay? Um, I think most people starting companies don't consider um, this as an option because for, you know, in a lot of cases, I know my own personal opinion was that venture capital had a bad rap in my, in my mind. And it was, it was something I had no experience with and I had no idea of the depth of uh, information and the depth of the complexity of navigating those sorts of opportunities or, or, or even realizing those sorts of opportunities. So I think Stefan would probably you know, agree with me there. We've learned so much in the last year and a half in doing this. Um, I think that coupled with you know, you want to when you want to have goals and you want to have dreams that are bigger than the ones that you can think of. And if you can do that, those two things, understand how it is to grow something, especially if you have a good idea. Um, that's what I would tell myself is, you know, figure this this VC funding or figure, figure this capital market thing out sooner. Because I, 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 I was 55 when we started that process and I wish I was 25 because it was uh, jaw dropping to me. Hmm. Stefan, what about you? Yeah, I mean, 100% agree with MJ on that one. It's a, uh, it's a world that I didn't understand. I thought I knew something about, but uh, as we learned more about it, it was uh, something I realized I didn't know how it really worked at all. Uh, but yeah, I think that the, another thing with that is just from doing businesses where I've done them either with a, a myself, a one or two partners versus, you know, my last business had five business partners. Um, it's learning how to work with other people on your team uh, was be something and how to actually bring in more people. You know, I had anything to say to some of these guys that we meet with through these programs that are, um, you know, in their 20s or just getting started with a business for the first time is sometimes, you know, going out and working in the real world or the world that's not, you know, the entrepreneur world, uh, learning how to manage people and what that, you know, uh, an infrastructure for a business actually looks like and how it operates is knowledge that will serve you well as you grow a business. Learning, you know, just how a business actually operates uh, as early on in a career is something that's uh, tremendously valuable. And I think a lot of times I see some of these uh, younger kids that are getting involved and they're asking us questions. And that's one of the first things I usually tell them is go out and get a job in a, the, uh, you know, in uh, a business world and learn what you, you know, can from that world and then go out and do the business that you guys want to do yourselves. It's it's something that uh, has served me really well. Uh, early in my, in my career, I worked for some very large companies and kind of saw the good and the bad <laughs> and mm -hmm. have taken a lot of those uh, lessons with me as we kind of move forward. I, I think along those lines is, you know, when you're, when you're young and you have an idea and you don't necessarily think of asking for help for things. I know I, I, I probably didn't. And, and also understanding that it's only a small segment of the population that is willing to take these kinds of risks to start a company. So if you're one of those people that has an idea and, and wants to do something, then chances are you, you've been given that idea for a reason and it's just a matter of taking, uh, taking the right steps. I think people are afraid of, of failing for some reason when I started my first business, our my partners and I went to a bank uh, with a business plan to get a loan, you know, traditional bank to get a business loan. And within 20 minutes of the meeting with the bank, the, the bank said, yeah, we'll be happy to give you a loan. 
And I asked the banker, I said, boy, that was really easy. How come more people don't do this? And the banker said, well, you know, 80% of the world wants to work for somebody and only 20% of the world wants to be that somebody that people work for. And I think that's a really good indicator. So if you have an idea and you want to be, you know, the master of your own destiny, then you have to be able to take and put some things at risk to make those things happen. Even if you fail the first time you do it or the second time you do it, if that idea is there and the drive is there, there are plenty of tools and, and people out there that are willing to help you achieve those goals. Great advice from both of you. Well, the time has absolutely flown by. What an amazing topic and amazing company and two very amazing founders. I can't thank both of you enough for your time today. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Doris. Sure. All of our listeners were absolutely in awe as well. Thanks, everybody, for listening in today. And thanks especially to our guests, Stefan Augustson and MJ Anderson, who are the co-founders of a very cool company called Reality Blue, based in Beloit, Wisconsin. Now, you can find more helpful information and resources on my website, globalocityservices.com. There's a library there of free blogs, tools, podcasts, and other resources for entrepreneurs. I'd love to hear from you. My door is always open for comments, questions, or suggestions, or just to shoot the breeze. You can reach me at dnagel, N-A-G-E-L, at lakesradio.org. I promise you'll always get a response from me, and I'd love to hear from you. Be sure to join me again next Saturday at 11 a.m. Central, noon Eastern. And until then, I'm Doris Nagel, wishing you happy entrepreneuring.